The following sermon is a part of our Go Deeper Into the Gospels series. It was presented on Sunday, December 10th, 2017 by Pastor Daniel Kelcanio at Glad Tidings Church of God in Font Hill, Ontario. It is titled, His Name. For more videos, please subscribe to this YouTube channel and visit our website at gladtidingschurchofgod.com. We are continuing our journey, which we began last week, and we're going to be on this journey for who knows how long, because we want to go deeper into the Gospels. It's been on my heart for a long time that we, uh, we explore the stories about Jesus and the teachings of Jesus to really go deeper into being his disciple. That that's what we're here for. We're here to be disciples of Jesus. And how else can we know what he stood for, what he taught, and what he did, unless we read about his life in the Gospels. And that's why we're continuing and starting this journey. I want to pique your interest every week. It's my goal. I don't know if I can do it every week. It's my goal to provide you with something that perhaps you've never heard before. Not necessarily. In fact, I got some feedback online. Somebody says, you know, you don't have to be an iconoclast. And I'll explain. That word means be like a rebel. You don't have to be a rebel for everything, you know, about what I talked about last week with the genealogies and such. I'm like, well, I'm not trying to be. I'm just, I'm just want to give people something that will pique their interest. Maybe they never thought of it before, and they'll start thinking, and then they'll be able to want to join in and read through and study the scriptures with us. So that's why last week we did talk about the fact that Jesus is the promised seed, the seed that, is, that was promised in the Hebrew scriptures, and how the gospel writers Matthew and Luke they uh, established the fact that Jesus was the promised seed in their stories about the visitations of Gabriel to Zechariah and Gabriel to Mary. That's what we explored last week. And then, of course, we explored the genealogies of Jesus, how there are two different genealogies. And yet, according to this tradition that we explored, that they are both the genealogy of Joseph. And one thing that we looked at last week when Gabriel came and visited Mary and talked about the destiny of this child that she was to bear, about the Messiah, she, he, Gabriel said to Mary, and we looked at this last week, he will be great and he will be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. So what we are celebrating this month is the birth of Jesus, right? But the birth of Jesus but what that is, is that God is finally fulfilling the promise that he made specifically to David, right? We looked at that last week, that David was the king of Israel, and he was a man after God's own heart, and God promised to him that one of his sons would be the king forever. We looked at this, and we saw this in 2 Samuel chapter 7, that I believe that top passage in Luke, when Gabriel says this to Mary, that Gabriel is referencing the promises made to David in 2 Samuel 7. You see how this works? Look what it says in 2 Samuel. God said to David, I will raise up your seed after you. That word descend in Hebrew is seed. I will raise up your seed after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. So God promised here that the Messiah would be his son. God is saying the Messiah will be my son. But look what it says. It will, the Messiah will also be a son of David, the descendant of David, the one that would inherit his kingdom forever, the kingdom of Israel. We've explored this many times, including last week, right? Where we've said, we said that Jesus is the son of God because of the powerful activity of God in Mary. Right? We know that, right? Because of the Holy Spirit, the power of God in Mary, that's why Jesus was produced. That's how and why Jesus was produced. And we explored that last week that Matthew and Luke clearly established that Jesus was a legitimate son through his legal father, Joseph. Right? Joseph, if, if nothing else, was his legal father. And therefore, he was therefore the son of Joseph and a descendant of King David. So I can say with confidence that the Jesus that is spoken of here, that the, the person spoken of here is a reference to Jesus. That the person that, that God is saying, I will raise up a descendant after you, a seed from you, is Jesus. It's a reference to Jesus. But I'm not actually being fair 
to the text of Sam, 2 Samuel 7. When, 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 he, when we look at a passage of scripture, we have to look at it in context, right? We have to understand, well, who's the person talking and who are they talking to and what are they talking about? What's the context of what, what's, what's going on here? The text in 2 Samuel is talking about a son of David who will build a house for my name. That's what God said to David, that your son will build a house for my name. Now, we can take that metaphorically or spiritually or whatever, but in context, what is he talking about? He's talking about a son of David who will build the temple, the first temple in Jerusalem, right? The text then goes on to say about this son of David that when he commits iniquity, when he sins, I will correct him and, with the rod, and he will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Now, Jesus never committed iniquity, right? We don't believe Jesus committed any sin. So this is not a reference to Jesus. This is a reference to a son of David. And I think, and most people agree, that it's a reference to Solomon. Solomon certainly committed iniquity, we know from, this, from the stories, right? And God promised that even though he did commit sin, he wasn't going to take away the kingdom from Solomon, even though he had done that to Saul for that same reason, because of sin and disobedience. So the passage is specifically about Solomon. Right? Or, or really, it can be about any of the sons of, it, the sons of David that followed him, but specifically about Solomon. So is it fair that I picked these few lines out from, in the previous slide, is it fair that I picked those few lines out from 2 Samuel and then applied them to Jesus? Is that fair? Yeah, it's fair. You know why? Because even though this passage is not directly about Solomon, we can certainly see in the passage that there are things that are and will be true of Jesus. So there was, and this is really important for what I'm trying to communicate today, there was an original, more immediate meaning to the text. It's about Solomon and the temple and his life. But there is a deeper meaning to the text that with the benefit of future revelation, you see the people before Jesus maybe couldn't have understood what this passage had a deeper meaning. But we can because we can see Jesus in this passage, do we not? The passage about a son of David who will have a kingdom that will last forever and he will be the son of God. So with the benefit of further revelation, we can see that there is a deeper meaning to this text. A meaning that points to something beyond the original, more immediate meaning. Now, I'm not making up this method of interpretation because this was a common method of interp interpretation by the ancient rabbis the people of Jesus' day and the, the rabbis that came, and it's well understood today. So in the days of Jesus and beyond, there was a common method of interpretation, the first being you do look to the more immediate original text. You interpret it literally. And in Hebrew, this is called the peshat meaning of the text, the literal surface meaning of the text. You know, in the case of, of the text we just looked at, it's about Solomon, right? But then there is a deeper meaning to the text, the rabbis would say. They all often would search for a deeper meaning, and this is called midrash. And the rabbis would find a deeper meaning, and how would they do this? They would usually uh, pick up upon one word, or even sometimes one letter in, in a word, and they would find some deeper meaning uh, to get out of it. And this is what I think, this midrashic method of looking for a deeper meaning, usually based upon a word or two, is exactly what Matthew, the, the gospel writer, the apostle Matthew, what he did in his text of the, the birth narrative. So let's look at that, Matthew and Midrash. For example, after reporting the fact that Gabriel visited Joseph in a dream, so Matthew tells us that Gabriel, the same Gabriel that met with Zechariah and Mary that we looked at last week, he visited Joseph in a dream and told him all about this virgin conception that we looked at last week. And we're going to explore this a little later. But this is, what, this is then what Matthew says about this whole event of Gabriel speaking to Joseph about the virgin conception. That all of this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, prophet Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated from the Hebrew and it means God with us. So Matthew is quoting Isaiah 7.14. But why? Why is he quoting Isaiah 7.14? Remember what I just said, that the, the Midrashic method, the, the, the idea of using Midrash, 
is this idea of you pick up upon a word or two and you find a deeper meaning. So what word in this passage from Isaiah do you think uh, Matthew picked up upon? He picked up upon the word virgin. Well, actually the, the words virgin and Emmanuel. And he connected them to the virgin conception of Jesus. You know, this is what I think. I think Matthew looked at this text and he said, he said to himself, whatever this was originally referring to, and I'm sure he knew what the original meaning was, it was about. I'm sure he said to himself, you know, I think it has a deeper meaning here. Who else was born of a virgin that we can call Emmanuel? And he then obviously said, Jesus. Who better than Jesus should be called Emmanuel, right? And therefore, that text in Isaiah 7, 14, as I said on the last slide, is a wonderful foretelling of the Messiah from the Hebrew Scriptures. That Matthew used that verse in his Gospel's birth narrative to bolster the fact that Jesus was produced by God, was from God, and he was not, his birth did not come about in any inappropriate way. Remember, that's always in the back of Matthew's mind. He wants to make sure that the readers don't have the misunderstanding that Mary somehow did something inappropriate. This is from God and it's pure and holy. But there's a problem with Matthew quoting Isaiah 7.14, as I already alluded to, that these, just like the, we, those verses from 2 Samuel, Matthew is quoting this verse from Isaiah 7, 7, 14, I would say slightly out of context. Here's the full verse. There it is on the screen. It says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Here's why take, taking this and applying it, in, applying it to Jesus is taking it slightly out of context. Because to whom did the Lord give a sign? Well, at the time, the king of Judah was a man named Ahaz, a son of David named Ahaz. He was not a great man. He was not a good man, not, not a godly man. But he was facing an imminent attack from the joint forces of the northern kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Syria, which in the text, at least in the NASB, is called Aram. So God assured Ahaz that this attack would not be a real threat to him or to Judah. So the king of Judah is worried about being attacked by these joined forces of Israel and Syria. And God reassures him and says, don't worry, this is not going to be a real attack. You're not going to have to worry about this. He even offered him a sign. I'll give you a sign to confirm my words. And I don't know, I read the text and it seems like, seems like Ahaz was uh, operating under a false pretense of piety. He was trying to say, oh no, I don't need a sign. Okay, well then he said, okay, then their Lord himself will give you a sign. So God himself gave him a sign. And that sign was that the virgin would bear a son and his name would be called Emmanuel. Now, interestingly, in the text, the sign was given to the whole house of David. It says that a son shall be born to him, a born a, to a virgin, rather. A son shall be born to a virgin. And it says he will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. Now, look at this. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. So there's a time frame here. What, what, the, what God is saying is by the time this Emmanuel child is born to this virgin, and before he even knows how to, choose, how to refuse evil and choose good, the kings of Israel and Syria will be forsaken, and, and therefore this attack that Ahaz is worried about will be not even an issue. So the Emmanuel child was to be born in Ahaz's immediate future. And in the few years after it was this, this prophecy was given. But we have to ask, which virgin gave birth to a child in the days of Ahaz? Any, can you, any of you think of a virgin who gave birth? I'm pretty sure there's only ever been one virgin who's been given birth before, right? It's not in the days of, of Isaiah. So how do we make sense of this? It's explained that in Hebrew, in the Hebrew text of this verse... The word that's translated here as virgin is the Hebrew word Alma, which actually just means young woman, which it usually is a virgin in Jewish culture in that day, obviously, right? But it literally just means young woman. So this is simply saying that a young woman will bear a child, and through that child, one could say that God is with us. So 
the forces of, of the northern kingdom of Israel and of Syria did not prevail against Judah, and therefore God was with them. So there is some child that was to be born in Ahaz's immediate future, and by the time that child could know right from wrong, the forces of Israel and Syria would not be a problem. But which young woman gave birth to the Emmanuel child in the text, in the context of this passage? We have no idea. <laughs> Scholars go back and forth and saying, we're not quite sure. Some say it could have been Ahaz's wife and son, and others say it could have been Isaiah's wife and son. That's the young woman and the child. We don't know. So the point I'm making here is not to dig deeper into Isaiah 7 and find out exactly what this means. The point is that Matthew quoted this verse slightly out of context because it was about a child during the time of King Ahaz. It's not talking about the future with Messiah, with Jesus. So what Matthew is doing here is he's using Midrash. He's connecting upon or picking up upon certain words in the text and he's bringing a deeper meaning out of it. And there are at least three things, I think, that Matthew picked up on that he saw in this passage that made him think that this is ultimately referring to the Messiah. First, the sign was given to the whole house of David. So yes, it was for Ahaz, but it says it was for the whole house of David. So I bet you his thought was, well, I bet you this is for the house of David generally going forward. This could be a sign for him. So it is not impossible to believe that there was an immediate fulfillment to this text, the Isaiah 7 text, but it also had a greater fulfillment in the grand scheme of the promises made to David about an enduring kingdom. And then when you see in the Hebrew scriptures, the Hebrew word Alma, when it's translated into Greek in what we call the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it used the, the Greek word Parthenos, which does mean virgin. This is 200 years before Jesus. So when the, the rabbis translated the Hebrew text into Greek, they used a word that meant virgin. So they saw a virgin in there, right? And thirdly, the name Emmanuel, which in Hebrew means God with us, is something that surely can have a broader meaning beyond that specific meaning, beyond that original meaning about the fact that God was with them against Israel and Syria. So what Matthew is doing, he's using this Midrashic method of interpretation. He's picking up upon certain words and seeing how they can have a deeper or broader meaning beyond the immediate meaning. And we have to remember, remember what Jesus himself said. What did he say about the Hebrew scriptures? He said that you can know about me from the Hebrew scriptures, that the Hebrew scriptures point towards him. So I bet you Matthew and the other apostles were constantly looking for Jesus in the Hebrew scriptures. Don't you think? That they were constantly saying, hey, that reminds me of what Jesus did. And we see that all throughout the Gospels and especially here in Matthew and the birth narratives especially. So Matthew was looking for ways to show that Jesus was the fulfillment of messianic expectation. And so knowing that Matthew was a virgin... And that she was given this privilege to be and to bear the ultimate son of David, this ultimate Emmanuel child, Matthew applied this verse from Isaiah to the birth of Jesus. And I got to say, it makes perfect sense. If we understand what he's doing, right? Originally, it doesn't mean Jesus. It wasn't referring to Jesus. But if, if you look at it in the sense of having a deeper meaning, it makes perfect sense that this verse can be applied to Jesus. Now, there's another verse that we Christians will often apply, and even Jewish people will often apply, to the idea of, of, uh, of the coming of the Messiah. As far as I can tell, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't believe the apostles ever quoted this verse and applied it to Jesus, but I, I don't think it's a stretch for us to do that. It's this, this verse that we know so well. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Now, I have to admit though, like the other passages that we just looked at today, this too, if we apply this to Jesus, is taking it slightly out of context. Most scholars would say that this text is actually a reference to King Hezekiah, who was the son of Ahaz, who was actually a wonderful king. He implemented policies that reformed the practice of the people of Israel and brought them back to God's ways and in fact, when you dig a little deeper into what each of these titles are actually meaning, it can very well apply to somebody like 
Hezekiah. So let's look at that. What do these words mean, these titles? Firstly, wonderful counselor. I think it's pretty straightforward. And with regard to the direction of the kingdom of Judah, the king would be somebody who would be wise and wonderful in his counsel, right? We don't have to spend too much time on that. It's pretty straightforward. He would be a wonderful counselor. But he would also be a mighty God. What does that mean? In Hebrew, it's the phrase El Gibor. And it actually just means that the king would be a mighty warrior on behalf of God. Now, how does that make sense? He's called God, mighty God. Well, it means that he represents God in terms of defending Israel. Lots of people, not maybe not lots, some people were called God in the Hebrew scriptures, even though they were not God. We're thinking of Moses and the Davidic king and the judges of Israel. They're all called God, even though they weren't actually God, they were representatives of God. So, with regard to defending Israel from her enemies, as we just talked about, they had enemies, Israel and Syria and so on. Well, that he would be a mighty God, somebody who would defend Israel on behalf of God. So he would be a wonderful counselor and a mighty God, and he will rule and strategize against Israel's enemies. But then he would also be an eternal father, which in Hebrew is aviad. The word avi means my father. And the word odd means eternity. Now, so therefore, I take it not as an adjective, not that he is the eternal father. And this is just not me talking. This is what scholars would say. He's not just the, he's not the eternal father. Rather, he is the father of eternity. So eternity should be understood as a noun. That the title should be father of eternity. And in fact, the NET study Bible, the NET study Bible, says that Isaiah and his audience may have understood this term as royal hyperbole, emphasizing the king's long reign or enduring dynasty. So it's not that he is an eternal father, but rather that he is the father of an eternal age, of the eternal kingdom of God, right? And then therefore we see that he will be the prince of peace because he will administer peace in that kingdom age, that eternal age. So knowing all of that, I prefer the translation from the NEV, the New European Version. And it says this, for, a child, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And look what it says, his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Divine Warrior, Father of the Eternal Age, Prince of Peace. So if you look at these names and you look at them in, in a bit of a hyperbolic way, like these are a bit of exaggerations, then we can apply it to Hezekiah. Now, he didn't have a long, enduring, eternal reign, but if we're talking about being a son of David, you can apply these sort of titles to a king, uh, one of the sons of David, the king, and in fact, Hezekiah. So is it applicable to Hezekiah? Sure. But is it a stretch to apply this to Jesus and to say this ultimately refers to Jesus? Not a stretch at all. In fact, it makes perfect sense. That who... Much, no, Jesus, much more than Hezekiah, is and will be the wonderful counselor, the one that will produce, uh, he will be the wonderful counselor, God's mighty or divine warrior, who is the father of eternity, the one who will produce an eternal age, which will begin when he returns and he establishes God's kingdom on the earth. And what will he establish? What will there be? What do we say? Peace on earth and goodwill to all men, right? That's what will, Jesus will establish when he returns, right? So I say this passage is ultimately referring to Jesus, who is the Messiah. So these passages from Isaiah speak of Jesus. And it is in these passages, I don't know if you've noticed this, it is in these passages we've been getting his name. He's called Emmanuel. He is called Wonderful Counselor, Divine Warrior, Father of the Eternal Age, and Prince of Peace. Now, none of those are his actual name, right? But these are titles that we can apply to the Messiah, and they have great meaning to us. But let's return to his actual name at the very end when we look at that. For now, let's continue in the text of where we left off in Luke. So we're now at Luke chapter 1, around verse 41 is where we're going we're to begin. Okay, after being visited by Gabriel... And therefore, accepting upon herself what he proposed, that she become the mother of, of Messiah, 
Mary then went and visited Elizabeth. Mary visited Elizabeth and confirming that God was with each woman and that there were, and, and was with each of their respective babies, Elizabeth said, or rather it says of Elizabeth, that she heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So both babies were brought about by the Holy Spirit, if you will. Now, John was brought about through normal productive means, but it was still a miracle because they were older and, and she was barren. And John, it says, therefore also was filled with the Spirit. The baby inside of Elizabeth, John, was a person of spiritual awareness because at that young age, he was able to even recognize that Jesus was in his presence. So being filled with the Holy Spirit herself, Elizabeth recognized and having this spirit-filled baby inside of her, recognized that Mary was carrying the Messiah. She said to Mary, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And, and then she asked, How has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? So she recognized that the baby inside of Mary was her Lord, was her Messiah. Elizabeth believed that what was happening to them, to herself and to Mary, was the beginning of the promise to bring the Messiah to Israel. The promised seed that we looked at last week had finally come to Israel, and it was coming through the woman that, had, that was standing before her. So Elizabeth recognized just how faithfully Mary had responded to the angel when the Lord said that this would happen to her. And she said that Mary was, and she said of Mary, blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what God had spoken to her by the Lord, what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Mary was a great woman, we take from this, right? That she was a great woman of faith. She responded to God with faithfulness and obedience and willingness and therefore, she also responded with praise. And this is where we see Mary's song, which actually, if you look at the text, very much resembles Hannah's song, another young woman of faith who was affected by God in that way. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Mary gives this song of praise. And we, learn, we can tell from this song that therefore Mary was a devout Israelite. She was a woman of faith, and she knew the Hebrew scriptures very well. Many of the lines in this song are direct quotes from the Hebrew scripture. And Mary said, God has blessed and prayed. So, so Mary blessed and praised God and said, God has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave, meaning herself. And she said, behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. So we must count Mary blessed because she has the distinct privilege of being the mother of of the Messiah. But I gotta say that Mary, perhaps only outside of Jesus, is the most misunderstood person in the in the Bible, or at least in the in the writings of the apostles. We tend to think of her as Mary on the left here, right? But she was actually Miriam, a simple young Jewish girl that who was chosen by God, not because of any great weird sort of idea but because she was a faithful young woman of faith. She was a woman of faith and that she was pure and that God was going to do this amazing act in her and she accepted it upon herself. So we don't want to think about all the, the ideas that have been thought up about Mary over the years. We want to avoid those ideas like she was immaculately, immaculately conceived. Have we thought, heard of that before? Or that she was a perpetual virgin or that she was the mother of God. None of these are taught in the Bible. None of these are true. We should honor her, however, count her as blessed, as the text says, that Mary continued to be faithful towards God in this whole process, right? And she continued with her words of praise in this song, and she recognized that what God was doing in her was he was finally providing for his people. She said, he has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. So Mary understood that what God was doing through her was a fulfillment of the promises that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I want to reiterate, that's what we're celebrating this month. That we are celebrating the birth of Jesus, but what that is, is the fulfillment of his promises that he made to Abraham and to the people of Israel. 
And who, how did that begin? It began with the birth of John. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months, the text says, and then returned home. But then Luke tells us about the birth of John. Now, Elizabeth gave birth to a son. And as it says in the Torah, after eight days, he was to be circumcised. And there's a Jewish tradition that goes back to this time where you would name the child during the circumcision ceremony. In fact, this here in, in the text of Luke is the oldest record of this Jewish tradition that they still do today. So Orthodox Jewish people still have their young sons on the eighth day circumcised and they name them during that ceremony. And we see it here spoken of of John and, and this is the oldest record of that. Now, the, the people there, the relatives and the family who, who were there, assumed that they were going to name the son Zechariah after his father. But I, I guess Zechariah had communicated to Elizabeth what the angel had told him, and they knew that they were not going to sell, name the, the son Zechariah. They were going to name him John. In fact, they asked, asked Zechariah to communicate on a writing tablet, and he said his name is John. And it was at that moment that he began to speak out loud again. And everyone therefore knew that what God was doing through this situation was of God. And they wondered, they wondered what, what John would do in his life. But Zechariah did not wonder because he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophesied. Firstly, he said, talking about what God was doing, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David his servant, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets of old. So firstly, Zechariah is saying that, that what God was doing was in fulfillment to the promises that he made to King David about the fact that there would be a king uh, from, from him that would last forever. Then Zechariah continues and talks about how God was doing this to fulfill the promises that he had made, to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham our father. And then he recognized the fact that John would be a prophet of the Most High. His son John, who is now only eight days old, he said he would be a prophet of the Most High and that he would go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his, to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. So John's purpose was to prepare the people for the coming of the Messiah, to call them to repentance, to be in a state that would get them ready to receive the salvation that comes through the Messiah. And then Luke continued and said that the child continued to grow, to become strong in spirit. And John, it says of John, he lived in the desert until the day of his public appearance to Israel. And in the coming weeks, probably in the new year, just in the new year, we're going to explore John the Baptist, his ministry and, what, and who he was and his role in getting the people ready for Jesus. But for now, let's just look at his name. Remember what I said last week? I want us to understand that these people were real Jewish people living in a Hebrew, Hebrew context. His name is Yochanan, which in Hebrew means the Lord is gracious. What a perfect name. To, to signal that God is bringing grace and salvation to his people that his name is Yochanan, which means the Lord is gracious, that he was the one to start that process to give the people an opportunity to turn away from their sin and embrace the Messiah. Are we going to listen to the message of John? And are we too going to, to uh, embrace the fact that the Lord is gracious and that in him we can have forgiveness? I, that's what I want us to think about, especially when we look at John the Baptist in a few weeks. Let's conclude my message this morning by just looking at the conception of Jesus as it was explained to Joseph. This is really interesting and important. As important as John was and all of the good prophets that came before him, as important as he was, his job, like all of the other prophets, was to point people to the Messiah, to Jesus. So Matthew then turns, if we look at Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 18, we then get this where it says, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Now the interesting thing is that Matthew actually doesn't tell us the story about the birth of Jesus. We're going to look at that next week in Luke chapter 2. So Matthew doesn't give us the birth of Jesus. This is all he tells us about the actual birth of Jesus. But Matthew isn't concerned about the telling of the details of Jesus, but rather to establish the fact, and I want everybody to understand this, just in case there was any confusion from last week, that Jesus is the Son of God by the Holy Spirit. 
That's what Luke said in Luke 135, which we looked at last week and we've looked at many times. And that's what Matthew says here. Jesus did not come about by natural means. He came about miraculously through the power of God and Mary. That's what the scripture says. And that's what we must believe. Now, Joseph found it hard to believe. Joseph was Mary's betrothed husband, meaning that they were legally married. Even though they had not yet conjugated the marriage, Joseph had not yet taken Mary into his home. But in Jewish tradition, in Jewish custom, you get legally engaged, which means you're basically married, except you just haven't gone the extra step of living together yet. But you're married. And so therefore, from Joseph's perspective, if Mary is pregnant, she must have cheated on him. And it's, it was his duty, because of the sexual immorality, to divorce Mary. Joseph had the, the, the duty from the Torah to divorce Mary. And he was a compassionate man. At least we can infer that from the text. He was compassionate because what does the text say? That he was going to do it quietly or discreetly or secretly, right? He was not going to, to make a public display of Mary's supposed, uh, you know, sin here. So she was, he was going to divorce her secretly. But then Gabriel appears to Mary, to Joseph rather. Gabriel appears to Joseph and says, Joseph, son of David. So there it is. He's the son of David. Gabriel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. So again, this is a parallel to Luke 135. Confirms to Joseph that what happened in Mary was not the result of fornication, but it was a miraculous act done by God for amazing purposes, that this child would be the Messiah. And it would be difficult to explain to others, and it was hard for him to grasp and understand, but Mary and Joseph would know that their firstborn son was a legitimate son given to them by God. Right? At the very least, Mary and Joseph knew because of what Gabriel had told them that they had a legitimate son from God and there was no wrongdoing here. But then one last thing I want us to look at is his name. A name, a name in Jewish culture, a name in Jewish culture is more than just the word that we use to refer to each other. It's more than that. It's a person's reputation. It's a person's character. So when we see that from Isaiah that Jesus was going, supposed to be called Emmanuel. We're not necessarily talking about the name we would use to reference him, but rather the fact that he would be God with us, right? And we believe Jesus is God with us. He brings God to us, and, and through him we can have relationship with God. And the Messiah was also supposed to be wonderful counselor, divine warrior, father of eternity, and prince of peace. Now, none of these, as I said, none of these actually turned out to be his name, the actual name that we call him to describe him, but they, or rather they do describe him, right? So the name that he was given is not, are not these names, but they do describe him. But here's the thing, even the name that he was given also acts more than just as a reference, something to refer to him as. It also describes what he, what he was and, and who he was all about. Who he was and what he was all about. I'll get those words right. Look at what it says in the text. Gabriel said to Joseph, she will bear a son and you will call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. I highlighted the two words, Jesus and save because in the Hebrew, the original, if you, were, if you will, the, if you were to translate it back into Hebrew, there's actually a little word play going on here. And we've talked about this many times before, right? But I, I want to reiterate this now. Jesus in Hebrew, his original name is Yeshua, which is the Hebrew word for salvation. So we have a little wordplay going on here. That Jesus, Yeshua, salvation, will save his people from their sins, right? And, and actually Jesus means salvation. It's actually the, the diminutive form of Joshua, which means the Lord is salvation. And there are many titles for Messiah, as we just looked at, but there's only one name. That perfectly describes everything he's all about. And that his name is Yeshua, salvation. Let's have Sarah come as we're going to close our service this morning. There is only one name that we need to say and call upon. To, to say we, that we're calling upon our Savior. And that is Jesus, salvation, Yeshua. 
Jesus came about by God's intervention in human history. Jesus is a result of God's doing, which is why Matthew then quotes Isaiah 7.14, the virgin verse that we looked at previously. There was nothing inappropriate with the conception of Jesus. The conception of Jesus was the fulfillment, the greater fulfillment of the words of Isaiah. Jesus was the long-awaited son who would be Emmanuel, God with us. Something that no one had truly ever done before. God was with them in various ways, but now he was with them perfectly and transparently in his son. So Matthew believed the angel and took Mary as his wife. And just to be absolutely certain, this is what the text says, that Joseph kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and called his name Yeshua, Jesus. So salvation is his name, and it is that name that I want all of us to call upon as we close our service this morning. If you want to be free from sin and death, if you want to be free from the fallenness of this world and to have new life in, in the Lord, then call upon the name of our Savior. And what is that name? It is Yeshua. It is Jesus. It is salvation. Let's sing this song together.